Titus chapter 2. And as Rod Sr. read, we're going to be in verses 8 and 9 today. Closing out this section that we've spent uh, three weeks on. You know, it goes without saying that uh, when you're interviewing for a job, that companies have certain expectations of you should you be offered the job and receive it. I mean, basic things like uh, working hard, uh, being there on time, being a team player, and even obvious things like not stealing from them. But yet, companies know that uh, the honeymoon will eventually be over. And given enough time, people will go from this high-energy team player working my all for the company to lazy, individualistic, bickering, complaining, and uh, even sometimes thievery. The answer? Well, most companies, because we live in a free, capitalistic society, focus on motivation. How do you carry someone through when that honeymoon's over? Well, you motivate them. You motivate them by, by salary, by bonuses, by benefits, titles. And of course, my favorite, motivational posters. Motivational posters came about during the 90s and, of course, have always been effective. Walking by, success. Hard-working integrity. Surely these things carry someone through when they learn to hate their job, hate their boss in their working environment. You agree? No, I don't think so. Sadly, though, even the other motivations are ill-equipped to combat the needs and the desires of the human heart. If you think about it, motivations are motivating the wrong way. How is it possible that you're choosing to take the very problem you have, desires and selfishness of the heart, and going to motivate via selfishness of the heart? Self-esteem, pride, vanity. You, you see, they're going about it the wrong way. And this is what Paul is going to deal with this morning. What are the expectations that God expects of his redeemed rebels in the workplace? And how does he motivate them towards good deeds? Well, in simple terms, it's the gospel, but we're going to flesh that out today. As the, in the words of the great philosopher Woody Allen, the heart wants what the heart wants, right? So rather than us dealing with motivations of carrots out here, Holy Spirit's going to deal with motivations of the heart. He's going to do soul surgery. Would you pray with me? And we'll look at this together. I'll do a quick review since it's been a few weeks, and then we'll dive into the text. Gracious Father, we thank you for your gospel. We thank you for the bad news, Lord, that your word is loving enough to be honest with us. That our heart wants what the heart wants. And that no cognitive behavioral change will do. No bootstrapping it in and of ourselves or dead moralism or legalism will save us. But that by your grace you have motivated us with a higher calling. That we have been saved not only for eternity, not only for the wonderful inheritance that awaits us, but for the here and now. To operate as ambassadors for the king that we carry a message of truth and hope and that how we live our lives, even in the workplace, affects how people view the gospel. Father, this is an especially convicting passage uh, for me today, for I spent many years in the secular workplace. And as I look back on my time, I realize that I was woefully disappointing to you in many cases. But Father, you are a God of grace and forgiveness. And I pray that all of us, rather than feeling burdened by our sins today, that we would, at the foot of the cross, give them up to you in confession. And that we would seek to please you in all that we do. Father, may we truly be a light in a very dark world. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. 
Well, Paul has sought to create healthy churches on this rock isle of Crete. As Homer said it, it was an island of a hundred cities, and there are churches in all these little towns that, that are woefully deficient. He says, I need you to appoint elders in every city, and then I need you to set in order what remains. It's a book about gospel change, good deeds, but not good deeds based upon our own innate goodness, which is an oxymoron but good deeds that are an overflow of the gospel. For by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, that no man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we might walk in them. Each one of us are disciples. It is not something we become. It is not a varsity letter Christian. It is who we are. We are mathetes. We are learners, followers of Jesus Christ. And as such, he has left us in this world to be a light. We are the carriers of his gospel. I mean, if you ever thought about it, God could have saved people on his own. He didn't need you or me. And, and I would venture to say that I'm on the cheap end of the tools if he had had a choice. But yet God is pleased to take the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He's chosen to take the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He has chosen the things which are not to show the things which are. are. And we sit here today redeemed. Have you thought about that? We're not just here to do church, to go to church. Certainly this building is not a church. We are a called out body of believers. We are ambassadors. And whether we have the gift of evangelism or not, we are to emulate the gospel. We're going to get into that today, but it's a very interesting thought that we are here to emulate the gospel. That people are to look at our lives and say there's something different because I knew that person when. You know, I long for the day, this is just a side note, but with all the politics going on and the debt ceiling being raised and and all the scandals, I long for the day for someone to bring out some dirt on a politician and for him to say, yeah, I did that and it was shameful and I shame the name of my Lord. But I want to let you know that I've asked for his forgiveness and I've gone to that person and uh, I've been redeemed. So yeah, you got me dead to rights. Wouldn't that be refreshing? Wouldn't that just be great? You know what? That's what we are called to do as Christians. Not only about our past sins, but when someone calls us on a current sin, we're to say, hey, you know what? Dead to rights. Would you forgive me? I repent. Paul is calling these churches to live out the living word. He's saying, hey, folks, you say you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you have been saved by his penalty on the cross, that his wrath was absorbed in Jesus Christ. Well, dead it, live it. Act like it. Act like who you are, Christians. And so he spends the first chapter and he says, hey, in order for us to have a healthy church here, we've got to put shepherds in charge of this flock. Men who are above reproach, the husband of one wife. Prudent, reverent. Guys who don't necessarily have it all together, but are mature in the faith. A step ahead of the rest, whose marriages are a picture of the gospel. And after you appoint these qualified guys, guess what I want them to do? I want them to be ranchers. And I want them to go take care of these false teachers who are upsetting the sheep, hurting whole families. Deal with the problem. And that's chapter 1. Chapters 2 and 3, he's going to deal with the sheep. That's the setting in order what remains. Let me show you how to build a healthy church. Well, it's older men teaching younger men the Bible and how to live it out. It's older women teaching younger women how to love their husbands, love their children, and submit to their husbands. It's not just teaching them theology. It's teaching them applied truth. And we saw that a picture of women's ministry is is not what we see in other churches today. It's not just Bible study after Bible study after function after function. It's these older women pouring into the younger. That while diet is important, we've got to have exercise. Input cannot come without output. And the truth in our lives takes root and it becomes a gospel change of good deeds. Good doctrine produces good deeds. So he's hit older men, younger men, 
older women, younger women. Now he completely goes outside the circle today. And this one's not based on gender or an age, but it's based upon our working in the world. What are these Christians, these little Christs, supposed to look like at their job? You know, it's, it's easy to say, oh, this is good stuff. I'm, I'm really excited to get into this. It's, it's very practical. Well, it is, but can I tell you, it's very convicting. Because I, I think if we were to go around the room today and we were just say, hey, you know, let's turn the mic off and be real honest with one another. How many of us have a tendency to clock out our Christian life when we clock in at work? I, I've been guilty of it. I've been guilty of holding back on opportunities to walk in the good works that God has prepared beforehand because, let's face it, um, I didn't want to be held accountable. Because I didn't want to take the beating for being the Christian at work. And then times I did do it, maybe it, it didn't work. Well, we're going to find out that, that our obedience is not based upon our definition of success. And our obedience at work is not based upon our conditions either. Our obedience is based on a much, much greater motivation. It's not salaries. It's not benefits. It's not insurance. And it's certainly not motivational posters. It's based upon the gospel, our Lord and Savior. Paul has already hit this motivation in these earlier uh, verses. Every time he deals with old men and younger men and older women and younger men, younger women, he says, so that, you need to do all this, so that, and he says it over and over again, in order that the gospel will not be dishonored. In order that God's people will not be looked down upon because they're hypocrites. Paul keeps driving it back to the motivation. Why? Because is it easy within Christendom, and most of us have grown up in this buckle of the Bible belt here, is it easy to think that holiness is brought about by good deeds and that I'm holy if, if I stay in this little box and I don't do this and don't do that and go, don't go to these movies and don't hang out with these people, therefore I'm holy and that brings favor with God. I think a lot of us would say, yeah, that's, that's what I think about when you say the word good deeds. Paul says, no, good deeds are an overflow of loving God. That holiness is a desire because our heart's affections have been changed. It's not a carrot out here. And that you don't find favor with God because of your good deeds. You have favor with God. Therefore, you do good deeds. Paul says, live out the living word. If you're taking notes today, we only have, we only have two points. Expectation. And motivation. We're looking at the what and the why. What we're expected to do, which we're going to find out is well beyond what the corporate world expects, and why we are expected to do it, which we're going to find out is not a motivation of self, but something that is much bigger than ourself. Let's look at the first one expectation. Look at verse 9. Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything. Now, let me give you a little background on slavery in the Roman Empire. Remember, I taught a few weeks ago that that word bond slave, it's not, it's not really bond slave, it's just slave. Doulos. It is a person who is owned by another. The historians estimate that there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. In some geographic regions, that was upwards of 50% of the population was in slavery. And while there were some abuses uh, and there were some activities that went on, much like we know of our history of slavery in America, it was a different kind of slavery for the most part. Many slaves were well-educated, uh, better educated than even free persons. It would not be unusual for you to go visit your doctor and find out that he was a slave, lawyer, accountant, it would not be unusual to have someone who was a household slave and after seven years was set free, much like an indentured servant. Slaves could own property. Slaves could get educated. And so what makes this particularly interesting is that while it would still work, the kind of slavery we see in the Roman Empire is not unlike our workplace. That you are 
part of that particular company. You are a slave to that particular boss for a period of time, for those number of hours. Now, you may not want to think about it that way, but you're going to find out that that's what's happened. You've been bought. The main command here in verse 9 is to be subject, to be submissive, the ESV says. In simple terms, to obey. Everything's going to play off of that. He's going to explain what obedience looks like, what it feels like, and the way we're to respond. So what does that obedience look like? Is it drudgery? Well, you know the answer to that. It's not. But don't we have a tendency to say as Christians, doesn't our obedience have a tendency to sound like this? I've got to obey my boss because it's the right thing to do. Like God saying, way to take one for the team. No, no, that's not obedience. That's drudgery. In fact, you you, you wouldn't even get kudos from our Lord for that. He'd say, you may be doing the right thing, but you're doing it the wrong way, therefore it's sin. No, no, obedience, submission. To put oneself underneath is the Greek word. To willingly put yourself underneath is to do it in delight. Paul addresses this, this in Ephesians 6, verse 5. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Let's just take that verse for a second. One, with fear and trembling. That means you recognize them as authority. Not by way of eye service. That means no hypocrisy, but with sincerity of heart. That you're, you're willingly, yea, excitedly serving them. And how are you serving them? It says, as to Christ. It's almost as if you are looking through your boss and seeing Christ. And saying, Christ has not only ordained the situation, but Romans 8, 28 through 30, that this is for my good and his glory. And that no matter what I do, it is a sacrifice to the Lord. Do you realize the Puritans did not differentiate level-wise between a ditch digger and a doctor? Do you know why? Because they saw that both were offering a sacrifice to the Lord with their hands. And so it made no difference how much education this one had or how much this one had. If they were working with sincerity of heart, each sacrifice was equivalent. Therefore, each person standing before God was the same. I mean, they saw it rightly. But, but Rod, you don't understand. My boss, he's three sh- strokes shy of Hitler. I mean, he's terrible. You wouldn't believe his attitude. You wouldn't believe his Napoleonic complex, how demanding he is. To which my response is, if you look at the footnotes in your Bible, it says that if your boss is like Hitler, Hitler, obedience is not required. Is that what it says? If you have an overbearing employer, if someone is being unreasonable, then God's going to cut you some slack. I mean, I kind of hope that something's there. I'm looking, you know, even my study Bibles, aside, it, it's not there. Peter addresses this. In fact, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter 2.18. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. If you've gone to 2 Peter, you've passed it. Okay? First Peter 2.18. The question is, is obedience required? My boss is like Hitler. Verse 18, servants be submissive, there's that word again, to your masters with all respect. Not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable, who are obtuse. For this favor, finds is not in the text, for this favor, this this pleases God, if for sake of conscience towards God a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. 
For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it and patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. In the original language, it's the picture of this. You who willingly put yourself underneath, if you will bear up underneath, regardless of the downward pressure, this finds favor with God. Now, we could just end right there. That's enough conviction to send me home. But he's going to give us some real hope here. Let's talk about this verse for a second before we move on. Let's talk about it practically. Are there times you take a beating at work for no good reason? Yeah. Are there times when your subordinates mess up and you take the hit? Are there times when your boss is just flat out in a bad mood? Sure. What about the times when your division does really well, knocks the top out, but the whole company does poorly, and therefore you take the hit financially? Maybe work extra hours? Maybe extra work is put on you? Absolutely. And yet, Peter is saying there's something innately spiritual in bearing up underneath this. But you may say, but you know, I, I don't feel like I, I'm, I'm spiritually enduring. No one's coming to me and saying, hey, I want you to renounce Christ. It doesn't make a difference the situation. It's our response that makes the difference. The expectation is that you now have the ability because of the Holy Spirit residing within you to respond rightly regardless of your circumstances. As we've been learning in biblical counseling, you are not a slave to your circumstances. They do not determine you. They may be hard. They may be real. But by the grace of God, you have the ability to respond rightly. Imagine the slaves in the first century. They suffered for a myriad reason at the hands of their masters not the least for asking to go to Sunday church. Our response is really answering the question of how Christ has changed our life. And Peter didn't get this on his own, and Paul didn't get this on his own. They got it from who? Jesus Christ. Peter actually walked with Christ for at least three years, and he remembers just ringing in his ears Luke 6. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit, what grace literally is that to you? Even sinners do the same. John MacArthur puts it this way, if bond slaves are obligated to submit to their absolute and often cruel and arbitrary masters, how much more are free believers to respond and submit to an employer, even one who is mean, unreasonable, and overbearing? Okay, okay, Rod, I, I, I'm, I'm good with this. I understand where to respond rightly, even when we're treated badly. I got that. Everyone would agree with that until we start talking practical, right? Because it's always good until you get there Monday morning and everything's gone awry. So let's talk about it practically. What does this obedience look like? Well, let's start by talking about your participation in the deal as slaves. You say, what do I mean by that? Well, if I'm supposed to respond except, respond rightly, except in immoral or unethical cases, if I'm supposed to be obedient regardless of how my boss treats me, then what part do I play in this transaction? Well, I'm glad you asked. The part you play is when the wage is offered. You have the right to accept the wage for the work to be done or to reject it. What this means practically is that we have to cast aside the world's understanding of the tail wagging the dog. Do you know what I mean by that? The tail wagging the dog? That's an employee demanding his rights from an employer. It is not scriptural. Don MacArthur again. A Christian worker who is first of all concerned about his personal rights and who participates in non-compliance efforts and work stoppages against his employer, dishonors God. Plain speak, Christians don't strike. 
You may be a teacher, you may be a pilot, you may have to work in a union shop. You're going to be called upon at some point to respond rightly. Christians don't strike. Your participation in the deal comes when you're sitting across the desk from that guy and he's interviewing you and he says, I'll pay you X number of dollars for this particular work. Your choice comes to either accept it and he's bought your time or reject it. And unless there's something immoral or unethical going on, your way out is a resignation. It is not demanding your rights. It is not gossiping. It is not getting your own way. It is not protesting. It is saying, I can no longer do this. This is not what I expected. Therefore, I have to resign. Both of those are honorable. The stuff in the center is not. Well, you say, well, this doesn't apply to me because I'm self-employed. Uh -uh. Not so quickly. When you make an agreement to accept money for goods or services, who becomes your master? The customer. You see, your part in the negotiation is, I am choosing to sell to you. You don't have to sell to them. And I'm choosing to sell at this particular rate, this particular compensation. Once that deal is made, I'm called to shine for the Lord. That means sometimes you have to eat humble pie because will customers be unreasonable? Yeah. I've had customers sue. If you've been in business long enough, you will be sued. How you respond in that situation reflects directly on the gospel. You see, we're called to have a do-what-it-takes attitude. That means uh, how do I make God look good at all costs? regardless of my situation. I remember when I was working for an international trading firm in the 90s, uh, oftentimes uh, I would have to have shipments that went out that were based on what's called a letter of credit. And that means that if that shipment didn't go out by that particular date, we don't get paid. Well, I couldn't just complain that the warehouse guys didn't get around to assembling my product or they didn't get around to shipping it. And so there were many a nights that a greenhorn like me had to go out and learn to turn a wrench all night or build a crate or, or drive a forklift to fill a truck. Why? Because the company was counting on it. You see, for me to say, well, that's not in my job description is incongruent with the text. Why? Because he's hired me to do the job, to get it done. And it wasn't immoral and it wasn't unethical. It just required an extra amount of work. Now, was I good at turning a wrench? Nope. Was I good at driving a forklift? If you see me on one, you better run. But I did what it took. Why? Because God's name was at stake here. You see, whether you realize it or not, people know you're a Christian in the workplace. You don't have to have the fish magnet or be reading your Bible over lunch. People know. The question is, what kind of gospel are you projecting? Think about Adam. Do you think it was the job he would have chosen? I mean, think about it. He was an, a horticulturist, a tree surgeon, a florist, uh, and a, a landscape artist, all in one. His job included everything from flower arrangements to shoveling manure. And he loved it. Why? Why? Because he didn't let his happiness be determined by his circumstances. He saw the much greater motivation is that he was God's vice regent. He was working for God in his stead. And so whether he was shoveling manure or putting together a beautiful flower arrangement, it was all to the glory of God. It's that Puritan dish digger or doctor. Do we think of our work as Christians as a sacrifice? I don't mean to sacrifice something we're giving up. I mean a sacrifice that we're offering to the Lord. A sweet-smelling aroma that he has given us life and breath and muscles and energy to serve him. And that we are a conduit for the gospel. Well, the next two charges explain how we're to put on a heart of submission, how we're to do obedience. And we see a positive and then a negative. And then we see a negative and a positive. And they both describe what a submissive heart looks like. Look at 9 again. How are we to obey? Well, we're to aim to please. Verse 9, to be well-pleasing. Don't you love it when you uh, 
maybe you go to a country club or a restaurant and, and you say thank you to someone and they say, my pleasure. I mean, that's one of those phrases that seems to have dropped out of existence at many places. You see, the word, the phrase, my pleasure, it just, it just embodies that concept of aim to please. Do you think of your, your work that way? That you aim to please? It's really talking about attitude, isn't it? I want to read you an old quote by Chuck Swindoll. He says, The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It's more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failure, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It's more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. If the main command is to obey those whom we have put ourselves under, then the first charge in how to obey is that we do it with the right attitude. We aim to please. Keep it going. Aim to please means, look at the negative here, that we are, verse 9, not argumentative. Literally, don't talk back. Paul addresses this in 1 Timothy when talking about the license that some Christian employees would take when they found out they had Christian employers. Hey, we see each other on Sunday. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. So that means I can be unduly familiar with you during the week. Paul says, hold on. Those who have believers as their masters, 1 Tim 6, 2, must not be disrespectful to them. Literally must not talk back because they're brethren, but serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. And so the question that comes to mind, well then, can we ever disagree? Am I just supposed to go and be just this slave? I clock in, I put a smile on my face, and I do my best, and I don't ever try to correct errors? No. I think there is a place. In fact, I think there's a place when you can dialogue with your boss. But I think how you do that is of of utmost importance. I think the military probably has the best understanding of how to do this. When an officer is speaking to his superior and he wants to express a concern, what does he say? Sir, what? You remember? Permission to speak freely? Sir, will you let me say something off the record here, understanding that through the utmost respect, I want to express a concern? I think there's a place for that, but I think you have to ask for it. Sir, ma'am, can I tell you the way I see this without being disrespectful at all? Do I have a permission to speak freely for here just a moment? You do it in the privacy of his or her office. You don't do it in front of someone else. You don't put him on the spot, and you take whatever answer he gives, and you go with it. The second command on how to obey is to Show loyalty, verse 10, but showing all good faith. Good faith literally means faithfulness or loyalty. That means Christian employees are supposed to be faithful to the company, faithful to their bosses. No side deals, no using the company tools for their own benefit, no taking the company company information. They're to be faithful. That means staying at a job for a good amount of time. Now, this is countercultural here in America. Now, I'm not saying you need to be like the Japanese where you go and you get a job and you stay there your whole life. But you shouldn't have 35 or 40 jobs by the time you're 25 either. I remember one time I was working at a pro shop uh, on Lake Conroe, and this young attorney wheeled up in his uh, Porsche walked in and said to this young college kid, me, 
said, hey, kiddo, let me tell you how it's done. He said, I'm all ears. He says, when you get out of college and you start working, you got a jet set. I said, what? It's a jet set. He says, don't ever stay at a place for more than six months. You got to rack up your bankable dollars. You go here and someone offers you more. You go here and someone offers you more and go here. And in a matter of time, two or three years, you're making more than it would have taken you in 10 years. Is he correct? Yeah, he is. You want to make more money, you jet set. But what kind of taste did he leave in his employer's mouth? Who probably in each case invested a lot of dollars in him for training continuing education that he never got back out of it. You see, if that man was representing the gospel, he just discredited it. He dishonored it. We're to put our hand to the plow and stick to it for a while. We're to bloom where we're planted. We're also showing showing loyalty means keeping your hands to yourself. Look at verse 10 again. Not pilfering. Now, it's easy to kind of skip over this one because you you can say, hey, I'm not a thief, right? I I, I don't go for the five-finger discounts, okay? You know, that's not me. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, the fact is, is we steal a lot, even as Christians. It may be something as small as office supplies or abusing benefits or even stealing time. Remember, your time has been bought. I mean, how many of us have made those repeated long-distance phone calls, either taking the employer's time or knowing that it's costing him money? Yeah, I think Paul's getting to the root of the matter here that, that if we can realize that this is so much bigger than ourselves, then we won't be so trivial. And of course, we all have a tendency to justify these things. Well, all these are the expectations, but now let's get down to the motivation. He's given us glimpses of it, but but I want to look at it in its full breadth and depth right now. Let's go back a little bit. Titus chapter 2. I want us to look at the three times he hits this in the passage. Chapter 2, verse 5, in talking about the older men, younger men, older women, younger women, he hits it twice. Verse 5, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. That we're to be obedient, faithful, holy disciples who are pouring into other people. Why? So that the word of God will not be dishonored. What does he mean by that? Well, the gospel sets forth a truth. The truth of rebirth. As I look around, I give you, I know the stories before salvation and after salvation. And if you're like me, and you are, your life is radically changed. The good news of the gospel is that I am a new creation. Old things have passed away, new things have come. And so when he's talking about a healthy church and discipleship, he's saying, do it this way. Teach the younger women how to love their husbands, love their children. Why? So that the word of God will not be dishonored. Because this truth of the gospel is claiming that it will change your life. And you will be able to do that which is different than the world. That you don't demand your rights. So do these good deeds as an overflow of good doctrine. Why? So that this good doctrine, this gospel, will not be dishonored. Verse 8. So that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Essentially saying, hey, the gospel is offensive enough. You don't have to be. If they're going to disagree, let them disagree with the truth. Let them not say, yeah, those Christians are all hypocrites? How many times have we heard that? Oh, they're just all fake. And now we see, he culminates it in the second part of verse 10, so that they will adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every respect. John Stott out of England, who died just last week, has a great quote on this. He says, our lives can bring either adornment or discredit to the gospel. I don't know about you, but that that puts kind of a a heavy measure of responsibility on me. You mean the way I live will either adorn the gospel or discredit it? 
the things I say and do, the way I respond to adverse conditions, to trials, the way I greet someone else will either make God look good or in the eyes of the world make him and his truth look bad. That's what Paul's saying. And it makes sense too. If God has chosen to advance his kingdom through the prayers and activities of his children, then we have a heavy responsibility. Now, don't misunderstanding. I'm not saying that if people like us, they'll like the gospel, right? Ain't no one in here who's that pretty, including me. No one's going to attract people and get them to like the gospel because we're so attractive. Because we've got it all together. God does the saving. He removes the stony heart and puts in the heart of flesh. But we can give the world an excuse to not even consider the gospel. Well, you know what? If that is what a Christian's like, that's the last thing I want to be. Was uh, witnessing to a guy recently who had really been put in a very, very difficult situation as a child. And uh, bottom line is the pastor just blew him off. He brought a very serious concern, a very legitimate concern, and the pastor told him, um, set an appointment with my secretary. He was a boy of 12 years old. Now that's bad. He discredited and dishonored the gospel. Is that what is keeping that individual from coming to Christ? Realistically, no. Because God saves. But it's given him the excuse that we didn't need to give him. That's hard, isn't it? The point is is that we cannot be a hurdle. Philip Towner explains that slaves were known for their readiness to embrace new religions. And you can imagine the skepticism of their masters when, you know, a slave would come home and he's talking and all this rhetoric about new religion, about it's going to make him holy, it's going to attain to a higher standard, etc., etc. And then the master watches and he sees his work fall off. How many of us as college students... Maybe we got saved in college and went home and started talking about Christianity and witnessing to our parents. And we're not even helping with the dishes. We're making our bed. We're expecting mom to do all the work. And we talk back to our dad. And they're thinking, how real is this faith? How real is this faith that doesn't even make you as civil as you would be to a stranger? No, it says we have the opportunity to adorn the doctrine. I love that word adorn. It's from the word cosmeo, which we get our word cosmetics from. And what do cosmetics do? They enhance what's already there. Eyeliners darken the lid to make the eyes bigger and brighter. Tapes the face, exposing the contours that make it look more pleasant. It, it, it causes it to shine. 1 Tim 6 1 says, All who are under the yoke of slavery are to regard their masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. I've got a little bitty commentary at home. I think someone gave it to me. You know, one of those those deals that someone just picked up in a bin somewhere and said, Hey, I thought you might like it. Well, as I was looking at it one day, I realized it was by a gentleman who I grew up playing at at his son's at his house with his son. It's Dr. Paige Patterson, who's now president of Southwestern Seminary. And at the young age of 24, he wrote a commentary on Titus. And he gives one of the best little illustrations of what it means to adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. He says the gospel of God is like an evergreen, a stately evergreen in the midst of a very harsh and cold environment. The truth of God's word in the world. And it stands as a picture of hope And at Christmas, someone takes that evergreen and brings it in their house. The lights that are put on the tree are the adornment that make it even more beautiful. Holy lives are that adornment. How many employers bring the gospel, bring the Christmas tree into their workplace? Even non-Christians get Christmas trees, right? And we're the lights on that gospel. They bring in the gospel through us. 
how we shine will determine how that gospel is received. So what is our motivation? We do it for the gospel. We do it for the name of Christ. We do it to make him look good. We don't do it for for us, things that make us feel better, either by self-esteem or benefits or salary. We do it for a greater reason, because those things are only as good as long as our circumstances are good. I don't care how great the salary or the benefits are, what happens when your work really starts to stink and your boss really starts to get difficult? No amount of money can make you happy, right? I remember I used to travel to a little town called Saffron Walden near Cambridge, England. And I had an agent over there, a very colorful old man, who used to work for the, uh, the uh, Indian attache for the crown, for the queen. And he used to tell me these stories about Indian independence and representing the queen. And I remember just, just enthralled with having um, that much influence and close to people who were so, so powerful. And I said, well, well, I bet you made a lot of money. And he said, oh, no, no. Pay scale working for royalty stinks. And I said, well, then, you know, the, the benefits, the working environment must have been phenomenal. And he says, oh, no. The worst benefits in the world in a terrible, terrible working environment. Well, then why would you possibly work for the crown? And he said, you do it for the name. You do it for something bigger than yourself. And I remember that's just kind of going over my mind. And on this same trip, we had an appointment with Aston Martin. We were trying to sell them some stuff. And I knew Aston Martin. I'd seen James Bond, right? Well, Stan, the guy over there, was explaining to me that Aston Martins are all handcrafted. You see, he had an affinity for all things bespoke. That means handcrafted. And so as we were sitting down in this factory looking at how these cars are pushed from station to station. Hardly any robotics. All done by hand. Signed on the engines. When we're talking to the vice president of marketing, a young man, and I remember asking Stan, I said, boy, this guy's got a dream job, doesn't he? He said, oh no. (laughs) They work him like a rented mule. Oh, then he must make a lot of money. No, Rod, I know for a fact he makes much less than you do. (laughs) Then why would he work here? Rod. He does it for the name. To be able to work for Aston Martin. You see, our motivation is not our circumstances. We do it for the name. We do it because there's something much bigger than ourselves. And we get an extra benefit. Everything we're enduring, no matter how unreasonable, was first okayed by our ultimate boss. Jesus Christ. We look beyond the temporal and corporate motivations and kudos from our boss to a much bigger motivation. Let me give you a couple of verses here. Colossians 3.23 Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Ephesians 6.7 seven. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. So this begs the question, does this mean that we can win people with just our lives and our good response? No, it doesn't. That would negate all the previous verses. Discipleship would then be just friendship. Rather, our response in our lives become a springboard to the gospel. 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense for everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence. This means that you live and work and respond in such a counter-cultural way in the workplace that someone's going to say you're either crazy or you know something I don't know. And you say, I'm glad you asked. And that's when you give the gospel. And for those who have no clue what this hope is, it's the fact that you cannot do it on your own. 
and that Jesus Christ has paid the price. But in order to accept that gift, you have to repent of your sins and place your faith in Him. So let's end with some practicality. What does this look like for us here at Metro? Because odds are a lot of us are going to forget this sermon by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning as we're driving to work, right? Well, firstly, we need to change our expectations. If this is about expectation and motivation, let's elevate our expectations. The corporate expectations are way down here. God's expectations are way up here. And in order to get there, we've got to change our motivation. So to change our expectations, let's, let's realize the bad habits we've gotten into. We're going to do some translation again like we did a couple weeks ago. These are some often repeated statements that I'm going to put out there. All of you can nod as though you've said them before because I know you have. And then I will translate. One, that is not in my job description. Anyone? Nope. You're all holy, right? Translation, I do not want to obey the Lord by not obeying my boss. Ouch. I deserve to come in a bit late. Ooh, now you're getting nasty. I think I got a raw deal on this when I was offered the job, so I'm going to steal time from my boss. All right, I'm doing my job, but I don't have to like it. Translation, I don't care that I represent the gospel. I'm angry at God about my situation. Quote, if my boss wasn't such an ogre, I would be more pleasant at work. Translation, my happiness is determined by my circumstances, not by the joy of a life lived for Christ. Our expectations have to change, meaning that we can no longer view those as acceptable statements. We have to pierce the veil and question the motives of our heart, and this is where the motivation comes in. As we change our motivation, we have to realize that if we are depending upon carrot-style motivators, they're not going to last very long in the workplace because we're working for sinful humans, and they will be difficult and unreasonable. And so if we're going to last long, if we're going to do our job in being the picture of the gospel, then rather than being motivated by things and motivational posters, we have to be motivated by representing the king, by representing his word and his name. In a phrase, it's about the name. Father, as we close our time this morning, We corporately ask you for forgiveness for dishonoring you in the workplace, whether by our attitude or by simple thievery, abuse of benefits. We ask your forgiveness for making you look bad. But Father, we rest in the grace that our sins were paid on the cross and that you have still chosen to use us as ambassadors. Father, may we go forth as heralders for the King one that herald the good news first by our life and then by our breath. May we be so countercultural as to force people to say what is different about you. And may we love others deeply enough to give them the gospel when asked. In Christ's name we ask it and we praise you. Amen.